we're going to shift gears a little bit here because I don't really do risk communication at all. Um, I'm a developmental psychologist interested in cognitive development and science education. However, I have had some interesting experience with communicating with people in my own discipline. So you can view this as a case study in scientific communication. The title of this whole symposium is Science of Science Communication, and the question is from whom and to whom, and um, there's a set of uh, publics, I guess you can call them, that I think are relevant here. Um, there's a set of people who do educational research, and I'm one of them, I do educational research. Uh, there's a set of people who are educators, who actually go out there and educate our students. There's the media, and there's the public. If I can find the public here, okay. Um, education researchers talk, um, I mean the media mainly talks to the public, that's their job. Education researchers mainly talk to themselves, <laughs> that's their job. Um, occasionally they talk to the media, and you'll see some examples of that later. I have to point this thing in a certain direction to make it work. I'm not very active. It's not working. There we go. Education research centers sometimes talk to educators, and educators talk a lot to themselves. There are many, many uh, journals for people in education about education, about how they do things in classrooms and so on. And there are some other exchanges. There's a fair amount of uh, this, uh, exchange between the media and educators, I think, and occasionally educational researchers talk directly to the public, but not very often. I want to talk about the education researcher loop. That's the main focus of my talk today. And the main idea is quite simple. If research on science education is to shape policy and practice, then the communication about that research within the discipline has to utilize the same criteria that's used in the science that education is all about. That is, communication about science education has to be scientific and follow the rigor of scientific communication. Um, I'm going to talk about something called an inquiry approach to science education. As you know, many science educators are convinced that it is a good thing. Some education researchers think it's not such a good thing. But before we can figure out who's correct in this battle, we have to decide what it is. And we just have to decide what good means. And the question is, is there a good, a clear definition of inquiry approach, or inquiry science, which as you know is very popular today. Here's an example from the uh, National Science Research Center. They have a wonderful kit that uh, are distributed across the country. This is put out by the Smithsonian, I believe. Um, this is a kit for floating and sinking, and it has all kinds of cool stuff in it. It has things that float and things that sink and beakers and ways to measure things, a whole bunch of materials, um, scales, cylinders, all kinds of other things. And the um, uh, a, a teacher education journal about this says the following. Um, this is one of many articles that describe these materials. Children investigate a single subject for six to eight weeks. The investigation is build upon one another, students get deeper and deeper understanding of science as they progress. Students develop the ability to think and behave like scientists. Scientists who observe classes that are using these materials are invariably excited to see children learning by doing. Well, this is an interesting statement. They're excited to see children learning by doing. Um, this is kind of odd for a scientific field, though. The justification for the method is based on the excitement level of the observers. Um, <laughs> This, this is not good for science. It's not based on reliable measures of student learning. This article had nothing to say about clear measures of student learning. This thing is driving me crazy here. Why are clear definitions important? From a National Research Council report on science education, um, I quote the following. Studies of inquiry-oriented cur curriculum programs demonstrated significant positive effects on various quantitative measures, including Cognitive, develop, cognitive achievement, process skills, attitudes towards science. However, there's essentially no correlation between positive results and the expert ratings of the degree of inquiry in the materials. This is a problem. This means expert, experts go into the classroom and they really love to see inquiry science. But you ask them, well, how much was there in this lesson? Or how much does that teacher use an inquiry method? And there's no agreement. Why is there no agreement? Because there aren't very good measures of these issues, even though these are very important issues. I think we have a technical problem here. Unless I'm pointing this thing in the wrong place, it won't seem to change. 
So the problem I see is that scientists often abandon their own evidential criteria for effectiveness when they jump into the science education arena. And I'm not the only person who's um, noticed this. Here's an interesting uh, quote from an article in Science uh, eight years ago. Why do outstanding scientists who demand rigorous proof for scientific assertions in their research continue to use and indeed defend on the basis of their intuition alone teaching methods that are not the most effective? This is the fundamental question, and I think it's something that has to be addressed. So let's go back to this education researchers talking to themselves and talk about how to improve that communication, improve the communication within the discipline. And here I'll get into a case study that's based on my own research. I think that the fundamental criterion for good science, as any good science will tell you, is the operational definition. What is an operational definition? It's a description of something in terms of a specific set of operations and procedures that are used to determine its presence and its quantity. Operational definition has to be publicly accessible to others so others can independently measure or test it. And we see this all the time in good science, clear operational definitions. So let me give you an example. An operational definition of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich looks like this. First thing you do is push the button. It's the result of spreading peanut butter on a slice of bread, spreading jelly on top of that, laying a second equally sized slice of, slice of bread on top of that, and what you wind up with is this. This is an operational definition of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. There's still some indeterminacy here, but it's not consequential. So for example, um, these are all varieties of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and they all fit the definition. So the operational definition works in each of these examples, but these guys are kind of anomalous. It's not quite clear. They see, <laughs> seems to me they're peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, so what do we need to do? We need to update and revise the operational definition, and science does this all the time in trying to define its procedures and its measurements until it comes out with a pretty clear, unambiguous statement that's very broadly accepted within the discipline. So when a scientist tells you that they've used method X, Y, Z, you know what they did. Science education needs this quite uh, desperately because the kind of terminology that's in this field includes things like constructivism, explicit instruction, Piagetian approaches, inquiry science. Oh, I teach, I use inquiry science. I teach, I use direct instruction. My children all respond to adaptive instruction, which is very student-centered and authentic. <clears throat> Authentic is really a wonderful word in science education. It's student control, it's right brain education, it's uh, hands-on education, okay? We need operational definitions of these terms if we're gonna have any discourse and any clear measurement of the effectiveness of science education. What do these approaches to science education entail? What happens without clear definitions? Well, you get furious debates. Here's a few titles of a few articles that have come out in the past several years about the area that I'm interested in, which are different ways to teach science. Here's one. Is direct instruction an answer to the right question? Here's another one. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heavens. What about direct instruction? <laughs> Here's another one where they threw down the gauntlet. Why minimal guidance during instruction does not work. An analysis of the failure of constructivist, discovery, problem-based, experiential, and inquiry-based teaching. <laughs> this is a really fun field. Um, and here's another article. Uh, should there be a three strikes rule against pure discovery learning, which appeared in a major journal in science education and educational psychology a few years ago. So these contentious disagreements are irresolvable until we reach a consensus on um, definitions. And I'm now gonna illustrate this with an example from my own lab where I was extremely sloppy in the terminology that I used and which had generated quite a lot of heat um, and not maybe that much light. Um, so this gets, does anybody have another one of these that I can make work better? Um, I'm going to, in my lab, we uh, study the distinction and the effectiveness between direct instruction and discovery learning. The kind of thing we're teaching, the actual stuff that we're teaching, is something called the control of variable strategy, uh, also known as, that's for PC though. Will it work? Okay. Control of variable strategy. What is it? It's a very simple procedure for teaching middle school children how to design an experiment. This is pretty fundamental to science, how to design an experiment. And the procedure is quite simple. This one doesn't work any better. <laughs> Must be an inquiry scientist who gave me one of these. Um, vary one thing at a time. If you vary one thing at a time, then you can figure out what caused something else to happen in an experiment. 
So it's a procedure, and it's also the conceptual basis. If you design a, quote, good experiment, you know, have identified a cause. And so there's both a procedure, a uh, procedural component and a conceptual basis for understanding how to design good experiments or how to master what we call CVS. Let me describe a study very quickly that we ran several years ago, but there's several other studies. We took about 100 uh, children and we gave them three kinds of instruction. And right now I'll call them type A, type B, and type C. That's not the terminology we used in our paper, but this, will become, this is the whole story. So let's just talk about type A, type B, and type C instruction. And what we do is, we assess children, we give them a little pretest, and then we give them the instruction, and then we do a post-test, and then we test them a few days later on other materials, and then we test them a week or two later, and in some cases, three years later. So psychologists call that near transfer and far transfer. We basically want to know, what do they know in the beginning, and what do they know after we taught them, and what do they know a few days later? We also used a lot of different materials so that our results are not specific or idiosyncratic to a particular um, kind of material. Here's a picture of some of the materials that we use. Um, we show children a bunch of springs like this and we say some of these springs are long and some are short and some are fat and some are skinny and some have thick wire and some have uh, thin wire. And your job is to set up, pick a couple of springs, see if you can set up an experiment to find out whether or not the thickness of the wire makes a difference in how far a spring stretches or the length of the spring makes a difference. So this is what the kids have to do. And, um, they select a couple of springs and a couple of weights and they hang things on this little wooden rack here and then they compare the amount of stretching. So here's an example. If we ask the child, to, can you set up an experiment to see whether or not the length of the spring makes a difference in how far it stretches? This is a good experiment. It's an unconfounded experiment. It gives you a unique causal result. If one of these strings stretches further than the other, you know that it's the length of the spring that led to the longer elongation. Uh, with the ramps, here's an example of a terrible exper experiment. Here the child is trying to decide whether or not the surface of the ramp makes a difference in how far a ball rolls. But these two ramps differ in every possible way. The one is higher than the other, one is longer run than the other. They use two different kinds of balls. One of them is smooth ramp, the other one is a rough ramp. And so this is a totally confounded experiment. And it's the kind of thing that our grad students do all the time, unfortunately. <laughs> but we straighten them out after a while. So, this is, we're trying to teach the children this very fundamental idea about, uh, about this aspect of experimental science. And sometimes we use a, we have a, we've built a computer tutor to do this also. It has a nice computer interface, but that's not important for today's talk. So the goal of the instruction is not to teach domain knowledge. What do I mean by domain knowledge? We're not teaching about energy conservation or friction or momentum. We have to use some physical materials, but our goal is to teach about experimental design. We want kids to be able to design good experiments. And our experimental variation, that is the variable, the variable in my studies, is how explicit is the instruction? Where am I going to be on this spectrum from completely open-ended inquiry, discovery, learning, to didactic, pedantic, direct instruction? That's an interesting and researchable question in science education. And so that's the kind of thing that my colleagues and I have been interested in for several years. And in a, one of our studies, we use three kinds of instruction. Each column here corresponds to a type of instruction, and each row corresponds to a feature of that type of instruction. So there are many different aspects to the particular way we can set up our instruction. Let's call them type A, type B, and type C instruction. You could, the material turns out in all cases are the same, and the goal setting is by the teacher in all cases. So the teacher is telling the child, let's see if we can find out whether the length of the spring makes a difference, or let's see if we can set up an experiment to find out whether the, the surface of the ramp makes a difference. In all cases, children are manipulating materials. So this is all hands-on science. But here's things start to differ. In the type A instruction, the teacher designs the experiment and says, I'm going to build this next experiment. And the type B and type C instruction, the student does it. Are there probe questions? In the type A instruction, the teacher says, can you tell for sure whether this is a good experiment or not? In the type B instruction, the teacher also says that. In the type C, the teacher doesn't say that. Now, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but the, the message here is that the operational definitions of these three types of instruction are extremely explicit and quite clear. Each column cor corresponds to a vector, to a package of, uh, that goes into a type of instruction. And as I said, we call this type A, type B, type C. 
Um, I, we, I'm calling it type A, type B, type C now, but in our paper, well, this is an idea that each of these is a complex type of instruction. In our paper, we use different terminology. Um, we started out in parts of the paper using kind of uh, psychology jargon. One condition was the training and probe condition. Uh, the intermediate one was no training with a probe. And the least controlling part was called no training, no probe. That's the most open-ended type. That kind of terminology doesn't get you into too much trouble in the education research literature. However, at one point we started to use this terminology, direct instruction, Socratic instruction, and discovery learning. And then things got quite interesting because people are extremely committed and extremely opinionated about what these things mean. Now, in fact, scientifically, it doesn't matter what these labels are. And in another way, it matters a lot what these labels are because the whole issue is clarifying what we mean by these different labels. So we call these direct Socratic and discovery in parts of the paper, and we even published some results that show that, in fact, what we called that vector on the left, direct instruction was extremely effective. The blue panel shows the pretest scores. The dotted line shows when the instruction took place. The pink panel shows what happened right after we gave them instruction. And then the yellow panel shows what happens a few days later when we gave them similar tests, but not quite the same. And as you can see, the direct instruction beats the Socratic and the discovery approaches. Direct instruction led to immediate um, learning and better transfer. This, study and several like it were picked up by many uh, articles in the media. Now, I've been in this business for about, I don't know, 35 or 40 years. I'm older than I look. And I never had any newspaper columnist ever call me about anything <laughs> that I did before. But somehow, this, the fact that we started to talk about inquiry science and direct instruction, these are very contentious issues in education, particularly in science education. And we got a lot of uh, reporters calling me up and talking to them. And some of the articles were really quite good. One in particular, this is an example of an article by a reporter who I had several exchanges with. And when the article came out, I was really quite impressed that it was really exactly described and clearly described what we did. And I'll read it to you real fast because it's, the detail is important here. Remember what I just showed you about our study? Pretty complicated, right? Here's a reporter trying to synthesize that so that someone who reads the Wall Street Journal can understand it. And that's a big challenge, as you know. The students receiving direct instruction were explicitly told to change one property at a time and given explanations. The discovery learners got neither. That's correct. In both cases, kids worked with ramps and balls. So everyone had hands-on science. That's correct, and that's important, too. The result, not only did more kids master the control of variables lesson from direct instruction, but, and this strikes at the heart of the claims for discovery learning, the latter approach did not give kids a deeper, more enduring knowledge. Those who learned the one variable at a time idea through direct instruction extended and applied their newfound knowledge just as well as the few who discovered it by themselves. Supporters of discovery learning, uh, so then she, you know, this, is, this is a balanced article, so she then calls up people who disagree with this stuff. Supporters of discovery learning say Professor Clark Scotty was too extreme and then in real life, students doing discovery learning get more guidance from their teachers. But that just raises another question. What's the ratio of discovery learning to direct instruction? This idea, once again, no one knows for sure. You have to have a zinger if you're writing. Right. And I think the zinger is correct. We don't know for sure. There's no universal answer to how much control and how much uh, open-ended instruction you want to have. I think that in the area of experimental design, it's extremely difficult for children to discover an unconfounded experiment, because there's nothing in a confounded experiment that tells you it's confounded. There's nothing there. You know, you, the, the, the materials don't talk to you. And so this is, a, I think, this particular domain is one in which discovery learning is not very effective. And that's what we find in study after study. But in other domains or other mixes, um, we need more studies of this type. Um, recent paper came out. I just came across this paper a few weeks ago. Uh, by a, a researcher who I don't, even, I don't know him all, at all personally. And I was really struck with how he's been looking at the literature. Now, this is now an introduction to a paper on the topic of science education. And look at how carefully he's formulated this. He says, we described the components of the project fully enough so that readers would, in principle, know specifically what was done. This operational definition idea, this guy has it. We do not use vague verbal tags like inquiry or direct. 
Single words or short phrases cannot possibly encapsulate all the aspects and variants of an educational concept or setting. Different people will ascribe different meanings and interpretations to such terms, leading to miscommunication and confusion, often unrecognized. Instead, we provide operational definitions or models of exactly what we mean and what we did. We do the same for the assessment and its alignment with objectives and instruction. This is terrific. This is what I think the field needs a tremendous, a tremendous amount of in which we don't find enough of in science education. We need really clear and articulate explanations of exactly what we did. And the labels, if anything, may cause more trouble than they're worth. It's the operational definition. It's the content of those complex listings of vectors. It's that package that really matters. Um, I have a couple of minutes. OK, here's another ill-defined but controversial topic, hands-on science instruction. Um, you know, you've all seen these pictures. They're everywhere. Everybody likes hands-on science. And, and uh, you know, we all have experiences as scientists where we got our hands on something and it was really terrific. But what does hands-on science really mean? What does it really mean? Well, there's a lot of questions you can ask about hands-on science. Hands-on what? OK. Well, one area that's quite important today is are the hands going to be on physical materials? And there are arguments about somehow the sensory motor aspects of that, and embodied cognition is a, is a hot topic in psychology. There's something where the hands really have to be on physical stuff, but there's also a tremendous amount of uh, material out there that's point and click, where you have virtual environments. And in virtual environments, you could do all kinds of wonderful experiments that you would never do in the classroom. So hands on what matters? Whose hands? You know, a teacher could do it. It could be a teacher whose hands are on the material. It could be a student's. What's the content of the science? Is it domain specific? Is it about physics or chemistry? Or is it about something a little more abstract that cuts across domains, like experimental design? So the requirement for operational definitions is revisited when we talk about hands-on science, as well as when we talk about um, uh, uh, direct instruction versus discovery learning. Uh, forget, I'll skip this one. This just shows you all the different combinations there could be of hands-on science. So what can we do about this? Well, I'm not sure what can we do about this. That's why I came to this meeting. I hope I can find out. <laughs> um, there's something I think I call it approach avoidance, which is to avoid educational practices claiming to follow approaches. You know, Piagetian approach, constructivist approach, situated learning, didactic approaches, hands-on approaches. These approaches. They give you a, a rough idea what's going on, but they don't tell you very much. And two people who say they've used the same approach may have done fundamentally different things. The devil is in the detail here. Specifying a Newtonian approach doesn't get you to Mars, OK? You have to really know what you're doing. Clear definitions matter. And um, these are just packaging. The devil's in the detail. And the challenge is to convey that deal. What kind of resolutions? Well. I think we need very clear procedural descriptions to facilitate um, subsequent studies. We need to avoid everyday terms. Maybe we need to copy physics. You know, physicists invent terms like charm and flavor and lepton. And nobody thinks that charm for physics means charm or charming. They, they know it means a very clear, operationally defined uh, set of procedures to come up with a certain measure. And I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>